So. But yeah, um, so no, they they do the circuit. You know, they're they're really working at it. They're working at it a whole lot. Right. So. Because right. um, it's it, you know it's such a popular show. Mm -hmm. Everybody knows about it. Everybody you know loves it. And I mean, hell, I'm a diehard original series fan. Yes. I mean, I've got a room that's 500 square feet down in my basement that is just nothing but pop culture and Star Trek. Yeah, you know, Star Wars, Star Trek, full size Vader costume. Oh, that's right. uh, that's like studio quality. One of my really good friends is Steve Sansweet, who oh, has yeah. written numerous books and has the largest private Star Wars collection outside of what Lucas has. And he lives up in Petaluma, California. Yes. And uh, he lives at a place called Rancho Obi Wan. That's what they named their house. And um, when Doug, you got the gates have a symbol on the thing when you go in, and he's got two barns that are attached to each other via this tunnel, and that's where the whole, the whole collection is housed in there. He's got mm -hmm. one room that is just all the various video games that were ever designed for you know Tie Fighter, X Wing, and all of these. And so what happens is whenever I go, and my wife and I will go. We'll end up in there at like one o'clock, two o'clock in the morning. She and, and, and his husband mm -hmm. are like coming out saying, "Are you guys coming back in or what?" Because we're down there playing games till like wee hours of the morning. We're having a blast, the two of us. So. Now, does he have props from the archives and films as well, or is it he has cantina, a full cantina bar with playing animatronic, you know, band? Um, he had everything that was ever released, whether it was from toothpaste, oh, toothbrushes, okay. to sheets and pillowcases, yeah. to the tiniest little thing globally that was ever released, he has mm -hmm. in quantity mm -hmm. in this collection. It's huge. Does he also have Indiana Jones? Because I know there's a guy who, who does the same thing for Indiana Jones. He has probably some, but his main focus has always been Star, Star Wars. Wars. And when we met, he was living in Los Feliz in a house that was kind of on the hill. And that's where he had his first big portion of the collection. Um, and that's how we met, because we had a mutual friend. And at that point, he, we were st I was still acquiring, he was still acquiring, and we would end up trading stuff. And he's like, you got something I need, and you got, I got something you need, and, and that's, because his he had been the, the head of the entertainment section of the Wall Street Journal for many, many years. Mm -hmm. That's what he did before he became the ambassador first for Lucasfilm. Mm -hmm. And now he travels the globe, making all the announcements, talking about what's upcoming, what's going on. He has stuff in his collection mm -hmm. that not even Lucas has. And when Lucas, even when Lucas says he's coming over, he has to hide this stuff because he knows if George ever sees it, George is going to go. I have to have that. That has to be in my collection. So he has no other recourse but to say, okay, you know. I wonder why so, George Lucas wouldn't have it in his collection. Sometimes things just go away, you know, they disappear, they, they go missing. I have one of the original uh, stunt sabers, one of the, the, the graph lexes, from the first film, okay. which I picked up at a convention in California in 1977. I had gone to Con, and that then security on the sets, you know, there wasn't right. anybody, so, and this guy was a trusted source. Uh -huh. He he pulls his come over and got something he might be interested in, and he helped pulls this thing out and it had been used as a as a kind of thing that you could toss, you know they wouldn't worry about damage, but it was still in really good condition. It was a real honest to god, this graph you know battery casing with handles and the whole nine yards. And I said, well, how much? He said, 150. Well, in 1977, that was a big chunk of change yeah. for a prop. Okay. Problem is, I have no provenance. I have nothing that indicates, I'd have to have somebody really look at it and, and clearly indicate. Otherwise, this is, I know for a fact, because I knew this guy, he, was, he worked at Fox, uh -huh. he'd been on the sets, you know, I knew this thing had probably found its way off somehow. So, and you know what they're, they're going for now at auction, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars. If you have his name. If, I, I don't even know who this guy is. We're going back to 1977, you know, at a, in a convention at, Hotel in downtown LA. You know? <laughs> okay. So it, I have no way of getting any kind of confer confirmation, you know, that it is. But it, I know for myself that it is, knowing who it was. So I got it from. But it's one of my prized pieces in the collection. Did he have anything else at his at his table that indicated what he worked on? 
you know, again, he, he had stuff hidden underneath this curtain, just the, you know, the veil and the table and the stuff that he only would bring out for people he knew were serious collectors. You know, it wasn't one of those things where he was displaying stuff because I think he might have been concerned about, you know, if somebody from the studio would walk by or from the film would walk by, might say, how'd you get that? I'll tell you this story. We all love Jaws, right? Mm -hmm. I, and other people too, throughout several year period, found the last casting of the original shark from Jaws in the Junkyard. What? Oh, wow. And it was in uh, a place called New Pick Parts. Uh, that was up in I remember that. Not Valley. Yes, yes. Sun Valley. Sun Valley. Sun Valley. And this guy would go to Universal Studios and he'd go to Warner Brothers and if they blew a car up in something yeah. or, you know. That's where it went. Kind of, he took the salvaged vehicles to the junkyard right. to sell for parts. Well, once in a while, he would pick up something that was on a studio lot. And when Universal Studios changed hands and the MCA guys, Wasserman, Scheinberg, everybody stepped down, studio changed hands multiple times in a really short period of time and things started disappearing off of that lot like you wouldn't believe i can't prove it but i know the shark was stuck in the boneyard in 1988. Mm. they took it down because it was on display right they take pictures but it. it was the last casting of the original shark out of the original molds right so they took it down they put up a shark that was just a generic great white shark, right. and they threw the casting of the original shark in the boneyard, and this guy went by mm -hmm. while the studio was changing hands, and all of a sudden the shark from Jaws went out the back door, the uh -oh. lot, and ended up in this junkyard oh, where wow. they put it up on poles, right. and they took the top off of a picket fence and stuck it in its mouth, you know, <laughs> to make teeth out of it. I had been looking for it for a long time, and a comic book artist friend of mine, Tony Rodriguez, we were working on a Snake Plissken project you yeah. know, together a little bit. He said, oh, you haven't seen Bruce? He's in the junkyard at Yupik Parts. Can I inquire about that? Guys came out and surrounded me. Oh, boy. And I suddenly felt like I was in a Mexican showdown. <laughs> like this, I swear to God, a guy came out yelling, screaming, because they backdoored that out of the gate permission oh, yeah. with everything else. I called Universal Studios about it. This was now 2002, 2003, and their legal department couldn't find paperwork. They couldn't find a requisition slip. It had been so long, a lot of the people just didn't care. Well, eventually, they closed the junkyard. My buddy, uh, Wes Matita, who's a Disney artist, mm -hmm. was just frantic about it because he had a whole Save the Bruce thing going mm -hmm. on. The guy donated it to the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences. Oh, wow. He didn't sell it because he didn't want to get busted, busted for, right, it. for it. But uh, I helped Joe Alves and uh, they, they got it to Greg Nicotero, who loves that oh, show, yeah. who loves that film, so they restored it and now it's at the museum. That's awesome. However, the point of the whole big story is the shark from Jaws disappeared. And that's what went yeah. on back then. Everything was disposable. You finished production, yeah. you just went. Nobody was thinking about in terms of, you know, marketing or value or anything along those lines. Logan's Run. Right. When Logan's Run came out, you know, when they had the last, the last day crystals. Uh -huh. You know, MGM had this, this thing going on, but they did no marketing. They did nothing. So I went and I found colored crystals and put double stick on the back of them, put them in a little bag with, you know, Logan's Run Last Day Crystals. And, and then I found the onk that they would wear. Mm -hmm. And I grabbed a bunch of those from a jewelry store for like, you know, 50 cents on the dollar. Got some little necklace things, put them in a bag and for the onk and for the Last Day Crystal. And I put, uh, I went out in front of the, the, uh, the, uh, the dome. Uh -huh. Uh, you know, the Hollywood, the, the, the Dome Theater with my buddy, and we would walk the lines. Get your last day, Crystal. Get your thing. They had done nothing. Yeah. And people were buying them up like crazy because they wanted something. To, you know, this was before all the, the, the marketing hoopla that Star Wars had created. But we were doing this because I thought, why isn't somebody making stuff, right. you know, for this movie? 
So that's what you'd do, you know. Interesting. Our generation, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, oh, yeah. Child yeah. actors from the 70s. <laughs> okay. You'd work on these back lots, and there was like great stuff all over all the over. place. All the time. You know, yeah. uh, props and things that were discarded that were in the boneyard. Uh, you'd, you'd find these great things everywhere, and it's all gone now. In 19, I think it was 77, I was doing some voiceover work on the Paramount lot, mm -hmm. right at the same time that the sets for Star Trek the Motion Picture were being built. And they were right across the alley mm -hmm. from where I was doing voiceover work. I was, they had done a, Schick Sun Classics had done a, a Tom Sawyer movie, a two-hour movie. And the kid that they had playing Tom Sawyer, they didn't like his voice. So I came in to revoice the entire movie as this character. And during my lunch break, I had wandered out mm -hmm. and I came up on the, the big doors, the big doors going into the sound stage. And I just walked in and all of a sudden I'm standing in the core, the engine core. The Enterprise. So I'm wandering around, there's no security, there's nobody, there's nothing, these sets are just being built. I, of course, you don't have a camera, you don't, I mean, that was, there were no camera phones, there was none of that. But I'm walking up levels onto the core, and I'm walking under the bridge set, and I'm walking, and I'm walking, and I'm like, wow, this is coming, this is coming, I'm going to see this, holy yeah. cow. And, you know, that's just the way it was. You know, mm -hmm. It was a different time when, when before anybody really realize the value of all of this stuff and what it meant from a you know marketing standpoint. But that was the beauty of, of being in the industry at a young age and having access to all the studios and the stuff, you know. I was uh, one of my dear friends, an actor named John Randolph, um, who would see him in everything. And I had done uh, Broadway with him. Uh, uh, and he became sort of my adopted father. He took me under his wing. And so I stayed in touch with him. And at one point, he was getting ready to do King Kong out of MGM, you know, the Lorenz one. And he said, you know, I want you to come over. Come over and hang out with me on the set. So, of course, I went over and hang out on the set. And we're in the offices. And he walks all the different actors, you know, from the film. And he's introducing me and whatever. And, again, everything was right there. Yeah. All this Kong stuff, all these props, all these whatever. It wouldn't have been hard to grab something and just walk out, you know, right. which is what happens. And it did happen up until the point that security became, you know, an issue. Because once, so, they, once they figured out that you know, Star Wars, Star Trek, that's all of those what action did. things that, yeah. you know, develops pop culture, yep. et cetera, et cetera. Now I'm seeing a lot of people at conventions, you know, from the films uh, who made all of these items, mm -hmm. you know, they're starting to get involved more with fans. Yeah, like yeah. and there's big companies that are doing some right. amazing stuff. I'm one of the few that on Wednesday I received my Tomy Enterprise. Have you heard about it? No, a, 30, like a reproduction? 30, it's a 32 inch solid die cast reproduction of the original Enterprise based on files from the studio. They work with the studio. They made 500 and it cost us 500 at the time that they were going to start. They broke the molds after they were finished with it, so it'll never be made again. And this thing is gorgeous. Mm. It's like it's this big, fully lit, mm. moving the cells, uh -huh. a lit shuttle bay with three little mini shuttles inside, and all the lights doing it. You can adjust the lights to do flashing and whatever you want it to do. They're already listing them on the internet for over two thousand yeah. dollars because there's only five hundred of them. That's it. Right. It'll never happen again. So mine arrived on Wednesday, and it is gorgeous, absolutely gorgeous. But there's a big market now. Yeah. You've got a company like the Wand Company that's producing uh, replicas of the Star Trek Phaser, the original series Phaser mm -hmm. and Communicator, functional. Mm -hmm. Communicator works as a Bluetooth phone. The phaser is a television remote, but they're not designed, and they're designed with hundreds of hidden features, sound bites and sound effects and things that from, from the original series. They are finishing up, they're supposed to release it this coming year, a tricorder, which is going to be absolutely amazing because I've seen the graphics and it's unbelievable. Have you seen anybody with their props from that company yet? N I'm not here. I have a phaser, I have two communicators that I bought because they're no longer being manufactured. So they're going for 
far much more money than yeah. what I paid for them originally. Um, but right now, everyone's waiting for the tricorder because what they're doing an exact replica with screens that function, you know, you can scroll past Edith Keeler, and, oh you know, and all the, the stuff comes with the scan, the medical scanner, and the, you know, but they're going to be, it's pricey, wow. you know, it's pricey, but they're going to only do so many, and then they stop. They're a UK-based company. There's a fellow in Atlanta who did Kurt Russell's Life Clock. Yeah, the Life from Clock. A, from Escape from mm -hmm. New York, and I just missed oh, it after yeah. You can stole. still find those. You can still find them. But the price went up. Oh, I know. The you price know went up. Like, oh, yeah. God, you, when, it, when they do show up, you got to get in at the beginning. Otherwise, right. you're not going to necessarily find it. You know? I think he was selling them for 400 And they're all gone. He might do another run. I've got a really beautiful replica of Deckard's gun from Blade oh, Runner. Uh -huh. That's got the LEDs in it, and it comes with the bullets that glow. You know, and it's it's just absolutely gorgeous resin copy. It's got everything going for it. Um, I, that's my thing. I love props. Yeah. Um, I said I have a full Vader suit mm -hmm. that all in studio quality. Um, multiple helmets, you name it. And no, numerous amounts of lightsabers. <laughs> you gotta start combing old photo supply places if there are any still left and digging through boxes for yeah, the reflex. I know, I know. It's hard to tell though, there's because they're all over the place. I can go on eBay right now and find hundreds of graphlexes for sale. Uh -huh. Anywhere from fifty dollars to three hundred and fifty dollars, right. depending upon condition and, and all of that. Mm -hmm. So and then they can be modified very easily into working lightsabers. Try and find my holy grail while you're talking. <laughs> <laughs> You'll appreciate it. Yes, I have a headpiece to the staff of uh, Rob. Uh, oh, yes, I have one of those. Got the Kyber Bowie. Right. From, uh, yeah, from the second film. Uh huh. Yeah. Um, I think of what else that's crazy in my collection right now. Um, you have the actual headpiece? No, I have a replica. Oh, okay. Even so, that's a. Wow. Um, but uh, I've got the whole display of the Kyber Bowie and Indies hat. The headpiece of the staff of Ron, you know, a little poster next to it, and it's, you know, it's nice. It's fun stuff. I've been I've been collecting it for over 50 years, so I've got this, like I said, a 500 square foot space that is full. It's it's like stepping into a pop culture museum. Sounds like because I've been using glass cases and all of this. You know, it's presented as if that's for, important. Yeah. yeah, for for that, person. I've got a full. Um, what I call my landing party kit. It has a, a tricorder, a phaser, and a communicator. Um, they're all fan-made. The, the, the tricorder is made by, was made by a guy, this was from the early 80s, whose real name was Jim Kirk. Mm. So they will say, oh, you got a Jim Kirk tricorder, you got a Jim Kirk phaser, <laughs> you know. Um, the, the phaser I had, I just had a guy named Clint Young do a re refurbishment on my phaser because it was a Richard Coyle Richard Coyle is another guy that was also making props and stuff. He was doing Star Wars and um, and, and and Star Trek okay. back in the 80s. Um, so I actually have one of Richard Coyle's pieces. Absolutely, Clint did an amazing job. It was absolutely gorgeous. Um, this is not ready for New York. Those oh, are, that is so badass. Does, oh, man. The Mac, I went to sit in Stembridge. And a friend of mine was a good friend of his because he didn't let everybody through the door because every yo-yo in the world or was a funky course. gun. Yes, of course, exactly. his place. And we got to talking, and he said, "Yes, I did that film." He said, "But my inventory's gone. His uncle got the rights to all of his armory, right? Even though he ran the place. Oh, Somehow man. there was a family dispute, and everything went out to auction. So he still had the place, but." couple of his buddies were using it to rent to different shows, but he didn't have the inventory. That's he said, so if you can find the Mac, he said, I can find the tube, and I can find a couple of other pieces for you, so you can rebuild it. That's just cool. So this is yours? Yeah. Oh, man, so I, I love it. The I, are just amazing. So I found the Mac 10 at another prop place that inherited a lot of Sid Stembridge's stuff, and they had made Jesus. a mold of the Mac 10. So, amazing stuff. so a little bit under the table, yeah. you know, I said, uh, look, what, uh, what can I do for you to get a, a Mac, you know, 
yellow front that wow. was so they poured me a casting. Because I, I just loved, I loved all that Great. gear and, and all that stuff. And I brought that to Sid and he said, okay, let's go in the back. So he found a tube that was the sister tube that Kurt Russell used in that film, along with the locking ring that went in the front. So I was making molds for a long time, which is why here at the convention, my daughter said, oh, there it is. There's the 32-inch Enterprise. God, that looks great. Isn't that amazing? Look at that. Yeah. Huge. And it weighs like 30 pounds. Yeah. And it's all die cast. Right. Yeah. And it splits because the saucer section could separate, even though they never did it. It Just like in, the, in Next Gen, they could separate the saucer. So this is uh, set up so that you can separate the main oh, body from the saucer wow. section. The electronics is what really I know. does it. It's, know? It makes it. So it makes it come alive. That's and I've got, you know, two small props that need little electronic blinks and stuff like that on there. So I gotta find I recommend to that. Clint Young. Yeah. Reach out to Clint Young. Okay. Yeah. He's on on Facebook. Uh, as he does, it's, that's what he does, is restoration uh, of props. Okay. Yeah. And if not him, there are a number of other guys that are doing some amazing stuff. Because right. technology now has made it all much, much more easy uh, to do that. Let's see if I have a shot of the, the room. You get an idea of what, what it looks like. Come on, come on. Here, here we go. These things become religious artifacts. Oh, yeah, they are. They're like, they really it's like do. finding the Holy Grail. Yeah, you know, the yeah. splinter off the true cross. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and oh, yeah. things like that. But there's, the Hell, there's the Hellboy Good Samaritan. Oh, yeah, there it Along is. Along with my thunder, part of my Thunderbirds and, and uh, Jerry Anderson stuff. That's great. Yeah. Oh, look at that. And then I've got the, 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 Hell, the Hellboy Hand of Doom. There it is. There's the, the whole hand. Oh, wow. Life size. Do you have the Blade Runner gun? Yep. There somewhere? Uh, I've got to have it in here somewhere, I'm sure. Now, that was made from, what was it? It was an, an Italian shotgun? Yeah. Did they uh, modify it somehow? It's, it's like two or three different components that went together to make Deckard's gun. Yeah. And then they did, I guess it was the grip that they did to make it look retro 1930s. Very good, like this one. This is. Uh, uh, Nick Fury's gun from the cover that Jim Steranko did of the first issue of Nick Fury, Agent of S.H.I.E.L.D. Oh, okay. Yeah. Do you have these posted online somewhere, all these photos? Um, no, I mean, I, I posted them on Facebook. Oh, okay. You know, for, okay. for certain groups that yeah. I belong to. Um, but not... Where the hell can I find it? I haven't seen... Oh, here this, we go. I haven't seen the second Blade Runner. I liked it. it okay. I after the second viewing, okay. I, the first viewing, I was sort of like, mm, but then as um, there you go. This is part of the. Oh my god! Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's part of. It. That's just. <laughs> that, yeah. That's fantastic. Yeah. Oh, and I'm just trying to get a room to put my toy soldiers in. <laughs> That's why the house, when we bought this house, as soon as I saw the space, because not only oh adjacent to this God. room is another giant room that's like for storage. Really? It's, got, it's fully lit like this, AC, heating, all of that, oh. and somebody had built it with shelving all along the lines of the inside. So now all the excess collection uh -huh. can be now looked at, and I can go through it because I found a, a local toy store uh -huh. that... Are so, they're so used to getting crap. Uh -huh. And I come in, everything's in box mint still. Right. She goes nuts. I come in, and so she'll call me, you got more for me? Wow. You know, and so I've made a little extra cottage living out of this. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. of course. You see course. some of the crazy stuff that's oh, in there. Oh man, that's fantastic. Yeah. Good for you. Yeah. Good for you. My friend Michael French, he's here today, hosts a show called Retro Blasting. Oh yeah, yeah that's YouTube. great. And Michael's yeah. Michael's face looks a lot like this too. <laughs> you know, I go in there, I was like, "Wow, man!" Yeah, it's a it's a total escape. That's great. You know, I've got the room wired for sound, and uh -huh. I'll, I'll go and I'll pop up nine hours of, of Star Trek bridge noises. 
Oh, yeah, just the, you know, the chirps and the little things, and I'll let that run while I'm in there working and doing stuff, but it's just, and the lighting, you know, this is only with the main, I've got uh -huh. special mini spots and colored spots. I've got a cosmos on the ceiling uh -huh. that, that does turns and twists and all of that kind of thing. Oh, it's really fantastic. fun. It's really fun. Good for you, man. Look at that. Yeah. <laughs> oh, wow. And my passion for 50 years. All my war games figures are yeah. in like a tote. <laughs> <laughs> my props are like, ah, So not table. only are we are we in these things, but we're also fans. Yeah, you know? I had no idea. That's right. You know, yeah. we're, we're, we're big on this stuff, and, you know, because we, we love it just as much as everybody else does. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. we just, in some reason, we're in a better position to be able to get a hold of things and find yeah. things right. because of connections and or being, you know, right there. But... You know, we're just as in intense about our passion for these things as the fans are. And if you're kooky like me and you can't really <laughs> grab a hold of stuff, you start going to the guys who built the stuff yep. to learn how to fabricate. Fabricate it. And mm -hmm. that, yeah, that takes years off of your life. Yes, it does. Uh, where is it here? I've got some pictures of all of my molds. Oh, wow. On the table. Well, 3D printing now has also made everything so much more accessible. Because now you can just get the files online pop it in your printer right. and boom, you've got yourself a phaser, you know. And then if you want to really work it and hollow it out, put the electronics in it, you've got oh, I've seen guys, I, I desperately want to get a Strange New Worlds phaser. Because there are there are guys that are making Strange New Worlds mm -hmm. phasers right now mm -hmm. that are fully functional. Wow. You know, and it's like, but I want one. I want to get, I want to complete the collection, you know. But they're pricey now. That's the problem. Things are no longer inexpensive. Yes. You know, it's one thing to have a Diamond Select or a Playmates phaser that's made out of plastic mm -hmm. and put some nice, decent parts on it you can find on eBay, uh, you know, to make it look better. But right. when you when they do these custom jobs, they're they they look like the real damn thing. Right. You but know? but you pay for it. You pay you for know? it. You'll spend a thousand dollars to get to get something like that. My daughter's outside, she wanted to do Padme on the dollar. You mm -hmm. couldn't find the holster. Right. You couldn't find the pouches. Now I casted them in foam. So, I know. And so it they, works. Well, it's comfortable. Falling, they're falling apart, but she doesn't know that <laughs> side. But this is what I had to go through in order to do that. I had to sculpt that mm -hmm. thing on the gun. Yep. You know, model the pouches, make all the walls, all that kind Look of stuff. You go, man. That's yeah. That's great. My basement smells like Bondo. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> Bondo, turpentine, you know. Uh, there's the buck I made for the shin guards, which oh, I yeah. casted the wrong material, but shh, don't tell her. She's happy. Yeah. That's why there's duct tape on the back that's of her. Okay. It's all right, though. You don't notice but, it. I mean, it looks great. Yeah, but that, I mean, that's the kind of stuff that I do. Uh, for Snake, I went a little bit overboard. Um, but, yeah. I can do some of that stuff, but the electronics part of it, that's where, that's where it gets That's tricky. where I can, yeah. you know. I can do some of that. I've had to redo a few things, uh, putting in some new LEDs and, and power supplies and mm -hmm. that kind of stuff, but it's uh, most of it's beyond my capability. Yeah, so. me too. I am, I am not an electronics guy at all. Just like I can put gas in my car, but mm -hmm. I don't know anything about the motor or anything like that. Uh, that, I, that I do know. That you do yeah, know? Yeah, I'm a car, car guy. Uh, okay, so. okay. Yeah. That's been a passion of mine too. Yeah, yeah. There we go. That's it. That's Stanley Kubrick night in our house. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> my daughter got into oh you know uh, the festivities. The of festivities, the festivities obviously. <laughs> <laughs> What, what, what else can we cover here in front of such a we're open well, questions? <laughs> um, well, I'll say uh, it says Tales from the Crib. It, Tales from so the I Crib. Agree. It's about us being child actors, okay. you know, what that was like. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't want to let down Peter. He probably won't. Well, um, when, he's, when he plays back the tape. We had um, an interesting thing happen to us while oh, we've been here. Oh. Um, yeah, I guess suppose we, we should start it with that. We should, I think we should start with that. Um, you were, he, was, he was sitting at his table across from mine and he's, he's looking and he's looking and he, says, he seems to think, I know this guy, I know this guy. And it finally dawned on him when he came up to my table and looked at one of the pictures of me as a younger me. And he, so he very surreptitiously says to me, he says, who was your agent 
in L.A. in 1975. Right. And he already knew the answer. Yeah. And as soon as I said, Tony Kelman, he says, yes, it was Tony Kelman. We met at Tony's house on right. Fairfax Avenue, just below Sunset, in 1975. And I, at the moment he said it, I flashed like it was right in front of me. I could see it right in Stephen's eyes. It was in my eyes. They was, I was like, he was standing there. The door was open. It was this big arched door with a big wooden, you know, like buckles on the door and everything. The light was coming through a window. It was also an arch window from the side. And there was a potted plant or palm tree or something just behind him. And he was standing there, and we introduced each other. We, you know, it was like, right. oh, you were you on my boat? And I had a script rolled up in my hand <laughs> because never I was getting ready to go on an audition. And he and I stood there for probably a half an hour or more yeah. having this conversation yeah. about, you know, young two young teenage actors in L.A. in 1975. With the same agent. The same agent. You know, uh, yep. hit it off right away. Right off the bat. You know, and uh, I remember his... Uh, Getting yeah, ready to go on his audition with his <laughs> script in his hand like this. He even remembers what I was wearing. Yeah, he was wearing uh, bell-bottom pants. He had on a shirt with a vest and zipped-up boots, zipped boots with a higher heel. heel. <laughs> yeah. And I was like, wow, And man. it was like, I knew, I, the moment, it, I remember it. And That's incredible. here we are, all these years later. Yeah. And it's like, because we knew so many of the same people. Yeah. We grew up working with Lance Kerwin from yeah. James at 15. You remember? Lance and um, Mackenzie Phillips from okay. you know, right. um, we Jody Foster was a good friend of mine. We, Christy McNichol, Christy McNichol uh, those Pamela Ferdin, yeah, Pamela um, Ferdin, Brandon know, Cruz, Brandon Cruz, uh, everybody. You name them. We from were all group. from the same agency, and we that's how we had, had first met. And here we are, all these years later, and it's like I, I am I am so delighted. <laughs> So absolutely delighted to have this man back in my life. Yeah, I had wondered you know. for years. I thought, my God, whatever happened to him? Yeah. I saw him walk out the door with 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 uh, Tony Kelman's daughter. She took him away on an audition. An audition. And that was the and, last and, I saw. And him. that was the last that I saw of him. Yeah. And, and you know, I always wonder. Gosh, I I wonder what happened to him. Because over the years, you start to think about our colleagues, mm -hmm. some of us who aren't with us anymore. I just learned, you know, Stephen told me that Lance Jan died in January. Yeah, that Lance, Lance died Kerman in, died in January. In January, yeah. that really hit. And uh, and all of a sudden, I'm sitting at my table, and I'm thinking, why, why is this fellow so familiar? <laughs> so while uh, Trina Thumper from James Bond had him captive for a second, I went over <laughs> to his table, and I was looking and I thought, is this this picture? No. That picture? No. And I looked at that picture and said, oh my God, there he is. Yeah. I know exactly who he is. That's when I turned around. So that that was a real, that's probably was, the most wonderful thing that's happened this weekend. It was yeah, a landmark Yeah, I mean, moment, really, so. I, I mean, so glad that I came because we, right. you know, we, and, we're, and he's only living 45 minutes away from here and I just live three hours in Asheville from here. Right. So we're, we're, we can now kind of rekindle you know, it's make up for lost time. Yeah. God, we, yeah. The stories that either one of us can tell of those times are, are, are amazing. You know, just to reconnecting on that level is, is, is pretty cool. We were you know? talking, the one thing that stands out, uh, I don't know about the child actors now that are contemporary. Different time. Much different time. But back then, I mean, uh, you were an adult from a very young age. Young age. And it was um, it was a little bit odd. You were out of sync with your peer group often, mm -hmm. but you had an awful lot of responsibilities, just like the adults. For a lot of money. You, know, uh, if you didn't do your right job. Right on top of you. It cost and, you know. So you were you expected to do your thing and do schoolwork, which was a pain in the neck. Pain in the neck. <laughs> we have, we went to uh, I went to Hollywood Professional School, mm -hmm. which was right in on, on Hollywood Boulevard, just on the other side of Western Avenue, and it was a school that was for kids in the industry. Right. And I had already missed two years of high school because I had first gotten to L.A. I had no interest in going to school and I fell behind. Yeah. So I did four years in two. I doubled up and did four years in two. But we were going to school with Lance Kerwin, mm -hmm. Leif Garrett, mm -hmm. um, Mackenzie Phillips. Um, who was the other gal on that show? Um, uh, the, the other sister, sister. Oh, I can't remember her name. Yeah. Um, um, 
but everybody, yeah. everybody was at Hollywood Professional School. All there at the same time. I was there for maybe a year or so, and then my dad plucked me out and said, I want you to be in public school. That mm. was a disaster. Because oh, yeah. That, you can't. You, you can't. couldn't really function uh, in public schools very well. You know? Yeah. Um, and there was often times where I would get work, I would get a job, I would turn in my schoolwork that was done with the social worker, the welfare worker, mm -hmm. and the teachers in the public schools wouldn't accept it because yeah. they said, well, we don't know that you really did yeah. it. And, you know, yeah. kind of a rivalry would happen. Well, this kid's in the, in the film industry yeah. uh, type of thing, and I'm just a teacher. So it, it, sometimes I had a lot of problems, also with the students there. I got pulled out of, out of, out of public school and that, because I was getting beat up every day. Kids were beating me up. Guys would, would say, hey, Mr. Actor, you got all this money, give us some money. Right. And then it would be the gang up on you. Yeah. My problem was I thought I was Steve McQueen who walked up to the kid ready to fight him and he broke my arm. No, so right see, the there you go. <laughs> see, there you go. I didn't, I didn't realize how small I actually was. I know. But I went through the same thing. Yeah. You know? I got put into school in New York when I because I was doing the series there, and they put me into a place called Lincoln Square Academy mm -hmm. by LSA. And Lincoln Square was right across from, from uh, Lincoln Center. And the curriculum and the schedule was designed around kids in the industry, so you could always get out to audition or rehearse or whatever you had to do. Um, and the kids there, I was most a lot of the kids in my class were all dancers in the dance theater of Harlem at the time. Uh, they were all working on Broadway. Some of them were doing Broadway shows at the same time, and that's where I ended up finishing. Well, I was supposed to finish when I got to LA in 1974. I was supposed to be working on correspondence from there. You can't put a 16-year-old kid in L.A. for the first time and tell him he's got to do, sit down and do three hours of schoolwork every yeah. day. Hell no. I wanted to run to Disneyland, you know, <laughs> Marine Land. I wanted to do stuff, and I wanted to enjoy everything. So that's why I fell two years behind. Also, when you're on a set, it's really, there's a lot of stress. Yes. You've got scenes you've got to do, things you've got to keep memorized. You've got to work with other actors. They'll put you into school for 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. You're working on that, trying to keep your head straight, yeah, we need and, you on set. and figure out what you're going to be doing that day. Yeah. Then they pull you. You're working on set. You're there for like an hour, hour and a half, doing whatever it is they need you to do. Then they say, "Okay, off to school." Yep. You go off to school. You're sitting five minutes. Oh, sorry. Right, sorry, we, we got to do a pickup shot. Just, we didn't, you know, we didn't get this or that. And that's the way constant you, interruption. Yeah, you that's know, the way you live your life until you got the hell out of school. So yeah. I was paroled in 1983 from school. <laughs> <laughs> Finally, and uh, I, school, the school experience, it just wasn't happening yeah. for me. On my end, probably on yours too, and some of the other people I yeah. know as well. Well, the problem is a lot of, and after a lot of people went on to college afterwards, you know, and my mom was one of those diehards that said, you need to have, you know, something else behind you in case eventually your career, you know, doesn't continue to go the way it is. And so, because most of my friends were now there and not free to be hanging out with me, I went ahead and enrolled at L.A. Valley College, which was a junior college. Yes. And I, of course, what did I do? I enrolled in film courses and television courses. The problem was I'd had more experience than the teachers did. Right. And so when, you know, we were, we were told, you know, you gotta, we want you to shoot on, on eight millimeter, super eight millimeter, uh, do a, like a one minute public service announcement. So I mapped out this whole thing, did storyboards, the whole nine yards, for a commercial for bionic parts, where you could go in and have bionic hands put on or legs put on. And I shot all this amazing stuff. I got a Bobu camera uh -huh. with high speed capability to do slow mo. And so, you know, this shows a shot of a guy taking a tire off and doing the lug nuts in a matter of seconds, okay? Guy running down Wilshire Boulevard, in, you know, at high speed, uh, you know, get into his office. Uh, all kind of lifting a, a car, you know. We did all of this just with practical stuff that was all around, but when I submitted it to get approval, he said, you can't do this. He said, how, how are you going to do this in Super 8? I said, watch me. And of course, when I screened it, he just, his jaw hit the floor, and I realized at that point, hey, there's nothing you can teach me. Right. Nothing, and so I, I pulled out. Because you grew up around You it. grew up around it. Yeah. That's so the best teacher. Yeah. That's it, experience. Yeah. 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 Onset experience. So it's like, don't tell me it can't be done. Well, I, I just did it. You know, so. with all of these things, we're still here. Yeah. And there's a lot of them that aren't. Yeah. 
you know. And, I've lost uh, a lot of friends over there. And though we've gone through baptisms of fire, we've, we've come through them and did go down a lot of bad paths that a lot of other people did. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you can come through it. We managed to make it off the beach on D-Day. We're just kind of at the shingle under the bunker right now. <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. That's the way I like to think of it. Yeah. It's very true. Oh, very, very true. But it's, there's, there's, you said something to me the other day. You said you understand me. Yes, it's true. And when you're up against the guys and, and, and you meet colleagues and people from your era who've been all through that, mm -hmm. all it takes is a look, look in the eye and you realize that guy knows exactly that what you've been, been through. through. As well, yeah. You know. The sacrifices you had right. to make, the things you had to do that you didn't necessarily want to do, the childhood you sacrificed. Yeah. You know, it's not to say that you don't have it; you just have a different childhood, loaded with adults, and that's how you become very old, very fast. Right. You know, you become beyond your years because the people you're dealing with are adults all the time. You know, and you are responsible for. Hitting your mark, knowing your lines, doing the thing, otherwise it costs the studio money and that's it, you don't work anymore. And it's different when we did it because it was all film shot. Yeah. If, if something got blown, mm -hmm. that was big trouble. That was a big trouble. Yeah. You know, yeah. Now they shoot digital, electronic, yeah, they can do things over and over again. Yeah, no, right. it's not, it's, it's a very different, you know. And if you're doing theater and you're doing like a musical or something like that, you've got all the extra added stuff that goes along with it, or the, the dancing and the singing. You know, I had to. I had to audition once for a play they were doing on the life of W. C. Fields for Broadway. It's called W. C. and Me. Yes, you remember that? They made it into a film. They made it into a film, I think okay. so. And for the audition, I was told you have to learn how to juggle because you got to show that you can juggle. I spent two weeks prior to the audition learning how to flip and juggle, so that when I could go, when I go in, I could juggle. You know, luckily it's a skill I've retained. Mm -hmm. But again, you get asked to do things and. and you know, that, like, what, are you kidding? Learn how to juggle? I mean, come on. You know, so it, it's, it, it happens. It happens. It's a, diff it's a different way of growing up. It's not a better way. It's just different. Yeah. You know, because, yeah, do I look back and do I have regrets? Sure, I do. You know, I had no relationship with my father. You know, because I was on the road all the time and my dad was holding the fort down as a chief of police in a small New England town. And he would go six, seven months at a time without seeing me because I was on the road doing a tour you know, of a show. You know, he tried to fly out when he could, but so we never had the kind of relationship, and I know he regrets that. Mm -hmm. You know, we never became close, ever, my whole life. You know, so there, yeah, there are costs that come from it, for sure. But if I could do it again, I would do it again, absolutely. If we could do it again, no way. No, no, so that we can that's, anticipate the that's curse. That's the trick. I know. That's, that's, trick. I know. Yeah. that's the thing. Is that you just don't know, you know, the opportunities that you, you get, the people you meet. You know, you're a kid. You doesn't, you know, wow. Okay, I just had dinner with Charlton Heston. Right. You know, and you don't realize, you know, like I said, I'm looking at him, and I'm not thinking it's Moses. I'm not thinking it's Judah Benher. All I'm going is it's Taylor from Planet of the Apes. <laughs> you know, right. That's that's who it was. Or, you know. Or being with Jack Lemon when we, I did a, a thing with Jack up in Canada, and having to be stuck in the snow in the middle of winter in Canada, and the van that was supposed to take me back to the hotel was not there, so limo pulls around and the window comes down and it's Jack. Jack mm -hmm. Lemon looking out the window going, "Get!" He says, "Get in the car." So I get in the car, and again, you know, I'm not talking about the movies, you know, the movies that Jack was famous for. All I'm thinking about is that I'm sitting here with Professor Fate from The Great Race. Right. And I want to talk to Professor Fate. And he's regaling me for an hour and a half drive on, you know, Natalie Wood and Tony Curtis and things that went on in the set and all this and all this. I mean, it's just that those are amazing, amazing memories yeah. that you only get from being where you are right. at the time. And those are the, those are the things I hold precious for me. Yeah, for sure. But, you know, it's... It's when something like this happens, and, and like I said, you look at each other and you both know exactly what you've been through. Yeah. You know, there, there's a, you're kindred at that point. You're just completely kindred. Right. You know, your family, yeah. and it's great. There's still a few guys around. Patrick Laberto is a good friend mm -hmm. of mine. It's the exact same way, you know. Yeah. Uh, some of the people that we know have left the business mm -hmm. completely. completely. 
uh, and distance themselves from it. You know, uh, some of them are big stars, you know, or were back then. But everything in perspective, we're still here. We're okay. There's more work to do. That's As right. my friend says, there's a lot of life still, still left to go. to go. So let's go. Yeah. You know, we we just one thing that I've encountered recently when doing either a low budget project or an independent project or even still some of the professional projects uh, as of recently, the experience that Stephen and I had growing up and the disciplines, a lot of those are lost on newer people. Yeah. So when we're on a new set mm -hmm. then we have to do something, I get this look like, you're really professional. <laughs> yeah. Wow. We haven't seen that before. Yeah. From anybody. I know. So it's, 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 it's still there. Yeah. I was doing a uh, stage play reading about three months ago of the Laramie Project in Weaverville. And uh, we were all getting together as actors to do a table reading. And there were nine actors playing multiple roles. And I'm sitting next to this one woman, you know, and we start working on the table reading, and we take a break. And she looks at me and she goes, You're a pro, aren't you? <laughs> That's what happens. And I said, Oh, well, yeah. And she says, I knew it. She says, Where'd you come from? <laughs> you know, it's. It, yeah, that's the thing. You know, it's a skill set you never lose. It's always there. If anything, the older you get, with the more experience you get, the richer it becomes. You know, uh, you be able to pull from more experience to, to layer the characters even more. Yeah, you know, like, it's, it's great. But even just set etiquette, as you mm -hmm. told me, yes. you know, knowing how to behave, behave in the work environment, yep. uh, which does make Do's a lot of don'ts. difference too. Yep. There was a lot of nerves on Star Trek, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, I had been there, done it. I knew a couple of people on the crew already, so I wasn't so green mm -hmm. with everybody because sometimes you're in front of a lot of strangers. But I do remember sitting while the guys were trying to light, which eventually I had to learn how to light mm -hmm. and haul cable and sandbags <laughs> and stuff for a buddy of mine who had a production company. You live for gaffer's tape. Oh my god. And you know something? One guy was in the rafter, other people were moving, I was sitting there, and the, and the key grip took a look and said, light him, he's a pro. So it just happens you grow up that way. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's an interesting, it makes for an interesting life. Right. You know, it's not for everybody, you know, but if you can survive it and come out on the other side, you and your wonderful family and my life and my wife and, and you know, I, I wouldn't trade it for anything. I really wouldn't.